In John chapter 15, Jesus said, As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Let me say it again. As the Father has loved me, I, has, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. The word abide means stay. Stay connected. Stay in. Rest. Be connected in my love. He gives, in verse 10, John 15, verse 10, he tells us how. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Let's put these together. As the Father loves me, I love you. I have loved you. Stay connected. Stay remaining. Stay abiding in my love. That means it's possible to be a believer but not stay. If he says stay in my love, that means it's possible not to. Agreed? How? Keep my commandments, and you will stay in my love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full. Now he just told us how to have a joy-filled life. He didn't just say some joy. He said my joy will be in you. Now, when the Lord's joy is in you, it is the Spirit of Christ inside you being joyful. It's not you joyful because you get to go fishing this week. Or you have a day off. It's Him inside smiling. How many know the joy of the Lord? You know what it's like when the Holy Spirit's inside you and He's smiling. He said, if you keep my commandments, you'll stay in my love and my joy will be inside you and it'll be full. That's enough motivation to make me want to obey everything he says. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the next verse. And then he says, he's going to define that just like is also defined in 1 John 3.16, says this is how we know what love is. He laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives. So now Jesus said, this is my commandment, love people the way I loved you. And the way I did it, he says, there's no greater love than this. Lay down your life. I laid down my life for my friends, Jesus said. He said, now you do that. You lay down your life so that other people can get saved. You lay down your life so other people can come out of darkness into the kingdom. You give up legitimate pleasures, legitimate good things to do my will so other people can be blessed. I want you to love other people the way I loved you. I laid down my life. I want you to lay down your life. That's my commandment. That's my commandment. Love each other the way I loved you. I gave my life. I laid it down. I didn't come into this world to do my own thing. I came not to do my will, but the will of Him who sent me. Lo, it is written in the volume of the book, I've come to do thy will, O God. That's how I loved you. Now this is my commandment. You love people, other people, the way I love you. And if you do that, you will stay connected to me, and my joy will fill you. That's what Jesus said in John 15. Then he says, you are my friends if you do this. If you do what I command you. And what he just commanded us was lay down your life. He said, if you lay down my li- your life to love people, you're my friend. Amen. No longer do I call you servants. A servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I have made known unto you. 
The prophetic opens up more and more and more. Prophetic just means the revelation of the heart and the will of God opens up to us more and more the more we lay our life down to serve God. Do you believe it? Yes. If, you laid, if you keep my commandment, this is my commandment, love each other the way I did, I laid down my life. You lay down your life, and if you do, you're my friends. If you're my friends, I'll reveal to you what, everything that's going on. And I'll put my spirit in you, and my spirit will be smiling inside you because whenever you lay down your life, it brings joy to my spirit. When you lay down your life so other people can get saved, I'll put my spirit in you full of joy, and your joy will be full because it'll be my joy inside you. Amen. That's it. That's the abundant life. Now, we've, been had a, we've had a false message of abundant life in America. We've been told that if you have a lot of money, a nice car, and a nice house, that's the abundant life. No sinners have that. The abundant life is the life of Christ. The abundant life is if you, if you drive a 14-year-old car, but you're in the will of God and you're, you're laughing with joy as you drive it. <laughs> That's the abundant life. And yeah, God can give you a better car or He can give you a, a, a bigger house. Those are blessings, but those aren't abundant life. Abundant life is being the friend of God. And, and it's not for wimps. This is not a cotton candy gospel. It's not a come on Sunday and I'm going to give pump you up with a feel-good message. To be a disciple of Christ means that we lay down our life. But Jesus said when we do... We get the joy of the Lord and friendship with God. I want it. That's all I want. There's nothing else I want but that. Because when you're his friend, he takes good care of his friends. He does. When you're his friend, the Lord is a good friend. He takes care of his friends. That's why he said, don't seek after all that stuff. The heathens are worried about all that. Yes. Seek first my kingdom. Amen. And all that will be added to you. Because yes, when we come into his kingdom, we come into friendship with God, we, we, we become voluntary lovers. We become volunteers to lay down our life so others can get saved, others can be discipled, others can grow in Christ. It's going to take the whole body. You'll be amazed what will happen in prayer meetings or in, in evangelism or when everybody shows up and does their part. Imagine this. this is, imagine there's a big boulder right here, this big. I don't know how much it would weigh. Let's say it weighed a ton. And our assignment was to move that rock from here over to there. And I said, everybody, come on and help me move this. And instead of, let's say there were 20 of us. And instead of 20 coming over to help, eight people came over. And 12 people sat and said, let's see if it works. And if eight people started pushing, but it takes 20 to push it. And eight people try to push and push. And what if out of those eight, four were pushing really hard, and the other four were just kind of doing this? And 12 were saying, well, let's see if this works before we get involved. And let's say... Between the eight, four are pushing their guts out. The other four are kind of pushing. They're there, but they're just kind of... And 12 are watching to see if it works. And then they, they can't push it, even though they try their hardest. And then they come back next week. They try it again on Friday night. They try it again on Sunday at 9. 
Then they come back again next Friday and try. And they text, try next Sunday. And they keep trying and trying. Say this goes on for months. What if, what if one day, 20 people get up and 20 people say, let's all do this with all of our heart. And the first time everybody gets involved, it just moves right across the room. Now, if that was a reality, if that's, the, if that's advancing the kingdom of God, wouldn't you think that Satan's plan is to get as many people distracted and disconnected from doing what they're supposed to do? It's called laying down our life to see the advancement of the kingdom. Now, what Jesus commanded us that we lay down our lives, he also commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, verse 15 and 20. It is upon us as believers to all be involved in praying and seeking to advance the kingdom of God in the earth for people to get saved and discipled. Do you believe that? Mark 16, Matthew 28. Jesus came and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So we're not just to make converts, but disciples. Amen. When someone is born again, they're converted. Now the process of discipleship begins. They need to be encouraged and taught and led and equipped and involved in serving. Somebody say amen. amen. Right. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. If we want to love God, we have to discover what he loves and what he doesn't like. If we want to be his friend, we have to say, God, we have to realize, why am I on this planet? It's not uh, for me to find out what I want. It's for me to discover the Lord, that he's calling me into friendship with him. For me to find out what he wants me to do to advance his will in the earth. That's why we're here. Anybody agree? The Great Commission is a huge part of that. Now, as I was showing a couple of weeks ago, I shared a prophetic dream, and if you missed it, you could find it on YouTube. The message is called The, the, the Weighty Presence of the Father. Now, that dream was, to me, very similar to the Lord coming to the seven churches of Asia Minor, and he wrote a letter to each of the churches. He told them what they were good at, where they were deficient, and then he gave them a promise. Are you listening? That's exactly what happened to me a few weeks ago in the night by a dream from the Lord. I've been having dreams for more than 40 years. I started having prophetic dreams before I got saved. I, my first dream that I, prophetic dream that I remember was a dream of the second coming of the Lord. And that, that's what helped me to give my life to Christ. So in this dream, now let me back up. In the seven churches of Asia Minor, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the Lord would come to each church and say, I know your works. And he would start with the good. He said, I know your love, your faith, your service. See the good things. Then he'd say, where well, you're falling short, but you've left your first love. Then he'd give him a promise. If you repent, this is what I'll do for you. Agreed? He came to the Laodicean church. He said, I know your works. He came to the Philadelphia church. I know your works. Philadelphia church. Now, I want us to know Jesus Christ knows everything about all of us. He knows everything about this church. He knows how real we are and how real we aren't. He knows our good spots and our bad spots. He came to the Laodicean church, and here's what he said. By the way, every one of the seven churches, he started out by saying, I know your works. So he's saying, I know where you're at. He said to the Laodicean church, 
You say, I'm rich and have need of nothing. Then the Lord gave him his evaluation. You're wretched, miserable, naked, poor, and blind. And you're not hot and you're not cold. You're lukewarm. And here's the heart of God. I love you. He said in the same letter, as many as I love, I correct. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Thank you, Lord. He didn't come and, and beat him up. He said, I love you. And then he gave him instructions that if they would follow those instructions, he said, if you do this, whoever overcomes, he said to the lukewarm church, you will sit with me on my throne. So the Lord's not so concerned about where we are. He just doesn't want us to stay there. He's not going to condemn us and beat us up if we have blind spots or made mistakes or we fell or we got distracted or we're out of his will. In love, he's going to come and say, hey, you're doing good here. You're doing good here. You need to fix this. And if you do, it's going to be really good. Okay, so that's what happened. That's a prophetic dream I had. I'm going to just say it again. In the dream, the Holy Spirit was saying, here's the things about our church that are good. The name John means beloved, and the scripture he gave me was, I love them that love me, and they that seek me diligently will find me. There are people, now some of you, if it's not, if this doesn't fit you, you can change and be part of this. But I knew this, I knew in my spirit, there are people here that are seeking God. And that's pleasing to the Lord. I knew he was pleased with that. The other thing was like God. It means the Holy Spirit said that speaks about sanctification. There are people in this church who sincerely are saying, God, change me. I want to be sanctified. I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. I knew that was in this church. There's prayer. There's seeking God. There's people that are yielding to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. I knew those were pleasing. And I also knew that in the dream, the part that we were not where the Lord wants us to be was having a burden for the lost. Now, the burden has to translate into real passion in intercession for them to be saved and actual steps where we take steps to evangelize. I knew in the dream, the Lord was saying, you're good here. I appreciate this. I like this. This is where you're weak. And then the promise came, I knew in the dream, that when we had that added to us, the heavy, weighty presence of the Father would come. come now, I'll, I, I shared this at a prayer meeting, I think Friday, but I'll share it again. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a church in Orange County called Melody Land Christian Center. I spoke with Mario Murillo. I spoke with Al Houghton and my older sister who had been to meetings there. And they told me about the glory that rested on that church for quite a while. It faded, sadly. And they had at that church, well, let me tell you about the glory. And one of the reasons why they had it is because they were strong in the area that we're weak in. It doesn't mean God's upset or he's unhappy. He loves us. He just gave us instructions. He said, add this to what you're doing and I'll come and dwell in your midst. At Melody Land Christian Center, they had, uh, every Friday night, they had evangelistic meetings. Every week after week after week, this went on for a long time, they had an average of 1,000 people saved every Friday night. Every Friday night. 1,000 people every Friday night. The presence of God was strong like a dome covering the whole grounds. Mario Murillo was raised under Ralph Wilkerson at that church in, at, back then. He said, he told me, he said, Joe, the glory of God was so thick in that place. It was so awesome to be in the presence of God there. He said, I did this more than once. When they locked up the building, I ran and hid in the bathrooms. I closed the stall and I hid. 
And after the building was locked, I'd come out in the sanctuary and I'd lay all night in the presence of the Lord. The presence of God was so strong, they, they said, uh, Al Houghton told me this, because he, he had been there. They said, every Friday night, they would fill up a pickup truck bed load full of crutches, wheelchairs, guns, knives, marijuana, and drugs that people threw on the altar after they gave their life to Christ or were healed. Every Friday night, a pickup truck bed. They said it was not uncommon for people to, uh, to pull into the... They'd hear about it. Oh, you got to come. You got to come. God's moving. People to drive into the parking lot. When they get out of their car, be smitten by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God, before they could make it into the building, would fall their knees and ask God to save them. When they say, oh, God, God, oh, I need God. He would save them. They'd get filled with the Holy Spirit, start speaking in tongues, get not even knowing what tongues was sometimes. Walk into the building and be healed before they got in the door. Come on, somebody. Now, when I heard these testimonies, now my sister went to one. She was there at a meeting. She told me who the guests, they had a speaker there that came to preach. She, said, she told me, she came back, she said, Joe, it was so awesome. She said, the place is filled. It was a round building. It had been a theater before. Ralph Orkerson bought it, turned it into a church. They said, when the preacher came, we were all worshiping like this. The worship was awesome. But God had put his spirit so heavy on that preacher. When he, when he came walking down the aisle during the middle of worship, we didn't know it was him. Like this, when he came walking, everybody on both sides of the aisles were knocked down like the wake of a boat. Bam! The power of God hit everybody as he, as he walked up there to preach. And then he said when he started preaching, miracles were breaking out everywhere. Now, I asked him, I said, why did that happen there? And without flinching, here's what I was told. Well, they had their, their midweek prayer meeting where they prayed for the lost. And they prayed for their community. It was as packed as the Sunday morning service. He said they were a praying church. All the people that came on Sunday morning came to the prayer meeting. And when you came in there, they were all groaning and crying and praying. He said, that's what released the glory. That's yeah. where we are. Amen. We're, we're at a choice. God's come. He's, he gave us a letter like he did the seven churches. He evaluated us. You're good here. You're good here. This is what you need. Thank you, Lord. I want you to believe this. I'm, I'm trying to get you to believe what God told me. Because if you believe it, we'll act on it. No, I, I can't remember what I said when. But in order to have a burden for the lost, we have to have the eyes that Jesus has. One of the reasons why I talked about a little bit in the prayer this has been something troubling me for a long time. Why do so many, and I'm not talking about all of you, because there's a lot of people that come here and pray. But why do so many professing believers don't have an agony, they don't have an ache, they're not groaning, praying for people to be saved? Why is that? And I'm convinced that it's in large part due to two things. Number one, we're not in the Word enough ourselves. And number two, we're, we have a barrage of an imbalanced, distorted gospel message being preached across America that's lacking any warnings or anything about hell or judgment. It's gone. You don't hear it. It's all about love. It's all love and grace. Not conviction, not sin, not judgment. And because of that, now that's not the whole gospel. And because of that, believers lose sight of it. We don't think about hell. We don't think about judgment. We don't think our loved ones are going to be tormented for eternity. We don't think how, danger, how much danger their soul is in because they're in rebellion. We don't think about that. 
We think God's good. Everybody's going to be okay. That's not the truth. And I had a dream back in 2002. I had on the same day this prophetic experience that Bob Jones did. He had the same experience as I did at the same time. We talked to each other later and confirmed it. Where I was taken into a theater and the projector was not playing. Anyway, I, in, the, in the dream, I found the power and I turned it on and it started. When it did, it started showing people falling into hell. Now, there's more to the dream. I'm not going to tell the whole thing. But I remember when I woke up from it, here's the first thing the Holy Spirit said to me. So clear. I, would, I remember it was so vivid, so graphic, so real. It was more than just a dream. My heart was beating and I was sweating. And I remember I was traumatized by what I'd seen. I saw hell. I said, oh, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? I heard it so clear. He said, I want the church to look at hell because I want her to do something about it. But she does not want to see it. That's what he said. It was confirmed because Bob had the same word. He had the same thing. God wants us to look because he wants us to do something about it. Now, I believe if, if we want to have a, we want to walk with God, we need to get the burden that's on his heart into our heart. That's what Paul prayed in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. This is what he said. That I may know him. How many want to know the Lord more? Yeah. All right, now listen to the next verse. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. The agony that Jesus feels for unsaved people, he wants us to feel it. Yes, and not just feel it, it should drive us to prayer and drive us to evangelism. If we're going to know the Lord, we also want to know the fellowship of His sufferings. It's not just peace, love, peace, joy, joy. He, I'm blessed, blessed, blessed. If I'm going to walk with Him, I'm also going to weep with Him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, for that to happen, we, one, we have to be willing. We have to start and say, yes, Lord, I want my heart to care about what you care about. I want to walk with God. Amen. Number two, we need to have eyes to see the same way Jesus saw. And here's what I'm getting to. Jesus is not only knew the scriptures, he not only knew the word, he was the word. Amen. He's the word made flesh. Here's Jesus sitting on a hill. His disciples are probably watching him, and he's weeping over Jerusalem. And they're probably wondering, why is he upset? They look out, all they see is the hills and the scenery and the trees and the buildings, and the Lord Jesus is weeping. They're disconnected from it. Why is he weeping? They see the natural Jesus is seeing in the Spirit. He saw the future. He was seeing judgment coming. That's what he was saying. He began to weep. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you're the one. You stone the prophets. You reject those that are sent to you. He saw in the 70 AD. Not one stone is going to be left on another. They're going to burn you. <laughs> Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a hen or chicks under her wings, but you would not. Why did he feel that way? He had eyes to see, and the disciples didn't at that time. They couldn't see it. Why? Because Jesus saw by the light of the Word, by the Word of God, by the Spirit, he saw and if we live as Christians where all we see is the natural realm, we will not have a burden for the lost. Amen. For example, Jesus saw everybody different. They came to Jesus in the gospel. They said, Master, did you hear about the tower that fell and it killed 18 people? Are you with me? 
Is this too much? The tower fell and killed 18 people. Here's what a pastor today would say. I might have even done something like that. They would say, oh, the tower fell and killed 18 people. Let's all hold hands right now. We're going to pray for God to comfort all those poor families. Right? Not Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of love. Jesus has more love for all those people than you and I. Here's what he said. Do you think they were worse sinners than all of you? He said, assuredly, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish. Now, was Jesus insensitive? Did he not care about the, the emotional turmoil of the people? No, he was more sensitive. He, what he saw, what he saw was where they're headed to eternal damnation. Makes a tower falling on you a tower falling on you and killing you is nothing compared to eternal torment in hell. Here's what Paul said when he was in Athens. He said, in the past, God has winked at uh, the idolatry of the people. Acts 17, verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he's ordained. And he's given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So here's Paul preaching to the Athens. What does he say? He didn't say, I want everyone to know God loves you. Here's what he said. God has appointed a day He's, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent because he set a day in which he's going to judge everybody by the man Christ Jesus. Amen. And he's proven it by raising him from the dead. People don't want to get saved unless they first know they're lost. Yes. Amen. And if you tell them that you can give them more pleasure then the pleasure of their sin, they won't believe you. The Bible says sin has pleasure for a season, but the wages of it is death. Here's what Paul preached to Felix when Paul was arrested. It said, Felix called for Paul and wanted to hear him concerning faith in Christ. So here's what Paul said. He reasoned about righteousness self-control, and the judgment to come. That's what Paul preached. Righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come. This is missing from today's gospel. Jesus warned about judgment. Not only did he say, unless you repent, you'll all perish. He went on and said, not only the tower, he said, what about those who were killed when Pilate mingled their blood with a sacrifice? He, Jesus repeated a second time, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you repent, you're all going to perish. Now, I know this is probably not the funnest message to hear. There's times I remember when our kids were little and we were feeding them, you know, when they're in the high chair. And all they want is the fruit. They want the gummy bears. They want the fruit. But you've got to give them some meat and broccoli. And you have to tell them, you got to hold it and say, open your mouth. <laughs> open your mouth. I don't want it. Open your mouth. <laughs> Wider. Take a bite. And they, mm, they eat it, and then they go, mm, then you got to put it back in. You need broccoli. You need meat. So this is one of those kind of messages. We need to have, we need to understand something. Yes. People are in danger. Yes. Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on. Jesus saw with the eyes of faith. Here's what he saw. Here's what Jesus said. They, now they come, Master, 
They're concerned. Someone comes worried to Jesus. Are there many that are going to be saved or few? Here's a modern pastor. Don't worry. Once saved, always saved. Have you prayed the prayer? You're eternally secure. And we speak the words of Satan to people. That's the modern preachers. They, someone comes anxious to Jesus. <laughs> That's what the question was. Are there few that will be saved? Here's his answer. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. And narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. The truth set you free. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You are workers of lawlessness. Okay. I'm going to try to wind up. I know this is heavy. But we need to get it. There's been a huge deficiency of broccoli and meat in the, in the gospel message in America. Amen. We've had Cheerios and Captain Crunch. <laughs> our teeth are rotting out. Our, our muscles are weaker than olive oil. You know, Popeye's wife. That's how the church looks, like olive oil. Skinny, anemic, weak. We ought to be burning with travail and passion. See, he'll say, depart from me. I didn't know you. Only those who do my word. You don't do my word. You get high. You smoke pot. You don't gather at church and hear my word and get equipped to serve me. Oh, but you love God at home. You believe in God. So does Satan, and he trembles. You have lust in your heart. You have unforgiveness. You're unclean. You're full of self-will. That's what he'll say to people. You're not mine. You're not doing my will. You're living your own life. I made you for me. You never surrendered to me. You, you say, Lord, Lord, I'm not your Lord. If anyone says they're a Christian, that means Jesus is their Lord. You might as well hear the scary words now instead of then. Here's what Jesus said about living in, in such a way as to cause other people to sin. Now, it's not only women can do it, but men can do it too. But some of the ways, sometimes women, and thankfully there's not people that do that here, they can dress in such a way to try to make men lust after them. Here's what Jesus said. Woe unto you to cause someone else to stumble. Or people that live in sin, they, and, they, and they're a bad example to other people. They introduce other people to pot and drugs. and It's okay, and let's do this. Jesus said, woe unto you who cause one of my little ones to stumble. Here's what he said. It will be better for you if a millstone was hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Woe unto you who lives in such a way to cause other, someone else to stumble into lust or to disobedience or to sin or to drugs or alcohol or to not go to church. You don't need to go. I love God at home. You don't need to go to church. We don't have to obey all that man stuff. It's not man stuff. It's the Word of God. The Word of God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Watch. Whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better if a millstone was tied around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Therefore, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that is never quenched, this is Jesus, where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. He said that after lusting. He said, if you lust, 
you've already committed adultery in your heart. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than have two to go into hellfire. How about this one? If we forgive other people when they sin, Matthew 6, Jesus said, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. How many people are in bitterness, unforgiveness, lust, rebellion, don't go to church, don't serve God, and under all of that feel like they're a pretty good person because I'm nice to the guys at work and my buddies think I'm cool. We will all be judged by the word of God. The Bible says, Jesus, now again, these are the words of Jesus. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body. Who's talking right now? Love. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of nothing but pure love. And here's what he's saying. He's warning people. Don't be afraid of those who can kill your body. I will tell you who to fear. Fear him who after having killed has power to destroy both body and soul in hell. That's love talking. There's a judgment day coming. We will be judged by everything that is written in the Word of God. You can come up with your own mamby-pamby, cotton candy uh, idea of, of who Jesus is in your head that, that thinks it's okay for you to live like you do. But we're going to be judged by the Word of God. In John 12, Jesus said, Whoever rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in that day. Oh. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. I'm going to give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do, D-O, blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. They may enter in through the gates of the city, but outside are the dogs, the sorcerers. The word sorcerer is pharmakia. It means pot and alcohol and drugs. The sexually immoral, the murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. They will be outside. Oh, uh, this is intense. Jesus saw all that. We need to get back to the real elements of the gospel. Now, I'm only talking about one side of it, about the judgment that's coming. There is a side. There's the cross. There's the mercy and the love of God that, that the human words are not adequate to describe. There's the love of God that no human words can describe how great it is and how merciful he is and how he'll take the worst sinner and in a moment by the blood of Jesus wash away every single sin and bring him into his kingdom. But they're both true. We can't just talk about the beauty of the cross. The cross has to be understood in light of eternal righteous judgment. When we say, I'm saved, we have to remember, what am I saved from? I'm saved from the judgment of God against all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. I don't know if I'm doing a good job or not. What I'm trying to get something across. Amen. Our eyes need to be opened. Amen. People around us are lost. Are. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm tr I, I pray it gets in our heart and we realize... Not because we want to go and browbeat anybody. That's, that's not what we're called to do. Or go just finger point. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to love people. But we, it has to start with this. I'm never going to travail and groan and pray and seek how to lead someone to Christ unless I'm convinced that the Word of God is true. Amen. They're damned and they're on their way to hell 
And if someone doesn't stand in the gap for them, it's not going to be good. And if we're Jesus' friends, we'll care about what he cares about. I want our church to be like Melody Land, where we care enough. Now, again, the way to move into what God wants for us, to move into the burden of the Lord and intercession and step out into evangelism more and more, is not just say, okay, I'll do it. It's go before the Lord and say, Lord, I really want to see with your eyes. I want to see with your eyes. And, and we've got to get this word. Hear that gospel CD. Hear it over and over and over. It'll get in us. And if we'll come before the Lord as a church and individually and say, God, here I am. Fill me with the burden of the Lord. I'll pray. I'll give. I'll go. I'm going to yield myself to lay down my life as a living sacrifice to see the advancement of your will. God will come and make his home here. When that happens, you won't have to go very far to lead people to Christ. You can stand right outside the door and lead 50 people every day. I've seen it. I, was, I had a visitation by the Lord. I've seen it. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people will be getting saved. See if there's anything else. I don't want you to go too early. <laughs> you know, I, you can tell it burns me up. It burns me up that all this greasy gray stuff is preached. It's the most harmful, damaging thing to the church. I know people that have gone away to the big famous church and they hear grace, grace. They're not converted. They came back more messed up than they went. They have no fear of God. They don't know what a real conversion is. Confused because they got a, a lopsided, distorted gospel message. It wasn't the truth. Let's pray. Lord, would you open our eyes to see the way you saw it, Jesus. Lord, you saw the judgment that was coming on the people and it caused you to weep over the city. God, you saw how lost they were. And Lord, you were so moved with compassion. And Lord, we ask you to open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. To see the way you see. And Lord, I pray that you would bring our, all of us individually and corporately into a place of intercession and action. Lord, that we would become filled with the Holy Spirit, anointed by you to become vessels, Lord. That we would we become vessels through which the lost could be saved. The backslidden could return to you. Lord, help us to be your friends. Yes, God. To care about what you care about. Mm -hmm. Lord, to love the people that you died for. Yes, Lord. 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 Lord, you're not willing that even one should perish. Lord, it's not your desire that one person should go to perdition. Jesus. 
Lord, use us as a body to stand in the gap and make it hard for people to go to hell if they live in Lancaster. Lord, 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 make your name glorious. Lord, let people be truly converted by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let their eyes be opened. Let them be converted and begin to walk with you and become disciples. That Lord, you would have what you paid for. Lord, 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 you didn't die on the cross because you want to damn them. But you want to redeem them. You want to bring them to yourself, save them, forgive them, heal them, wash them. Use us, Lord, to be your vessels. And Lord, help us. Don't let us. I pray this for me and all of us. Lord, don't let us get distracted away from what you're trying to tell us. Lord, we want to steward the words that you've given us. I'll tell you one other thing I want to share. I'll tell you the easiest, the easiest way you can lead people to Christ. How many would like to lead one person to Christ this week? I'll tell you the easiest, easiest way to do it. Are you ready? See Sandy Smith. Where is she? Sandy here. Sandy's on the overhead computer back there. Sandy's leading up our convalescent home ministry. Now, I've done this myself, and uh, you can do it. It's easy. See her and, and take time. You can go any time during the week when you have time. Go to a convalescent home. Walk down the aisles. Take one of these tracks. You don't even know how. You can just read this to them. Here's how... There's people, so many people in convalescent homes that are lonely and have no one to talk to. And I've done it before. You go room by room, stick your head in the door, and you smile and you say, hello, have you had any visitors today? How many can do that? Yes. And, and a, nine out of ten will say no. Say, would you like a visitor? And nine out of ten times will say yes. You come in and tell them your name. Hi, my name's so-and-so. I'm just visiting people. Then talk to them for three or four minutes. Ask them questions about their family or their grandkids. Just talk to them for a few minutes. And then ask them if they know Jesus. And sometimes they'll say they do or whatever. You can also ask them, are you able to read? And if not, could I read something to you? You can show them this picture. You can read them the track. Ask them to pray with you, and you can lead them to Christ. Everybody can get involved. That's the easy place to start. After you do that four or five times, pretty soon you won't need this anymore because it'll be in your heart. You'll know exactly what to say. Lord, help us.